Hi, welcome to this video where we're going to look uh, through the multiple choice questions um, which are published by the OCR exam board and they are on the circuitry system. The unit is called Transport in Animals. Uh, it's unit uh, 3.2, module 3.2. Uh, uh, yeah, and it's all about circulation, both in humans and in other organisms like fish and insects. Okay, so if you haven't done the questions yet, that's the first thing you need to do. Uh, either go to the link underneath the video, go to these questions, um, skip past the answers and do the questions and then come back to this video to look at the sort of thought process that you go through to answer these questions. Okay, so let's get into it. Let's start with uh, question one. So, where is the heartbeat initiated? Well, it's initiated in the SAN, the sinoatrial node, and the SAN is sort of on the right side of the heart in the atrium, so it's here. Zoom in a little. There we go, okay. Uh, what's next? Number two. The graph shows the oxygen dissociation curves of hemoglobin from an adult sheep and a fetal sheep. Uh, which one of the following statements describes the difference in the behavior of the two types of hemoglobin? Well, this one, uh, you should pretty much know this one. Fetal hemoglobin has a higher affinity. That means it binds oxygen more strongly. And that is because it has to bind oxygen more strongly if it's going to take oxygen from the mother's blood when it flows through the placenta. Remember the fetal blood and the mother's blood come very close to each other. They're separated by a membrane, but they come very close to each other. So the fetal hemoglobin has to sort of be, it's not pulling, but it has to be taking that oxygen with a higher affinity than the adult. Um, so for example, at any partial pressure, if we look at 40, for example, if you look at the adult, how much it's binding, it's like what 42% but the fetal hemoglobin is binding at something like 82%, so it's a, lot, it's a lot higher affinity. Three, which of the following is found in the wall of both arteries and capillaries? So capillaries don't have connective tissue, they don't have smooth muscle, they do have this. Endothelial cells line both arteries and capillaries. And remember, they sort of enable a smooth, relatively friction-free flow of blood. Four, which part of the body has the blood come from uh, if it's entering the heart of a human from the inferior vena cava? So remember uh, on the heart diagram, you've kind of got um, two vessels, you know, just they enter the atrium very close to each other. Do they actually connect here? I don't know, but then this is the right atrium sort of here. Uh, so this one, the, in, the superior comes from the head region and the inferior, that's this one down here, uh, inferior comes from the body region. So the body region, uh, it's not the head, it's not the arms, not the lungs, because that would be um, pulmonary vein, it's the abdomen. Abdomen is your sort of core, your sort of trunk, your kind of stomach area. Okay, so that's for that one. A. Five. Sphincter muscles are typically found in the walls of which vessels? So a sphincter is any ring of muscle that can constrict, okay? They're, they're found um, in arterioles uh, and also in other places like in the digestive system. Uh, there's one at the end of the stomach, which kind of only relaxes when you've kind of digested your food enough to, for it to be uh, emptied out into the small intestine. And of course, there's one uh, at the anus as well, which controls when you go to the bathroom. Uh, six, um, valves are typically found in veins. Um, so they allow only one-way flow. Remember the mind map, we had a picture of the muscle kind of squishing the vein and the blood going the one way. Seven. Um, here we see the oxygen dissociation curves for a solution of oxyhemoglobin. Uh, curve P and for mammalian whole blood, curve Q, whole blood. Okay, so R and S, this is important actually, R and S represent the oxygen tension in the lungs and tissue respectively. So let's label that. So R is lungs and S is you know, the cells and the tissue. Okay, um, so whole blood is physiologically more effective than a solution of oxyhemoglobin. Why is that? Well, to explain, let's look. So both whole blood 
and hemoglobin are, let's say, pretty much 100% saturated at R. But what about at S? What about at this value? If we draw a line kind of up here, um, then whole blood is kind of this much saturated. Now I'm estimating here, but you know, that's probably like 80% saturated. Whereas, um, did I say whole blood? So this is hemoglobin. Hemoglobin on its own, 80% saturated at P, whereas this whole blood solution down here is, I don't know, maybe 30% saturated, let's say. That's whole blood. So that means that when blood goes into the lungs and then flows to the cells, if it's whole blood, it releases kind of this much oxygen, okay? So down to this level. So it releases, let's say, 70% of the oxygen bound is released or unloaded. Whereas if it was just hemoglobin, it would only release this much, like 20%, okay? So that's what um, the, the statement that best fits that is this one. Whole blood yields more oxygen at S than, than does oxyhemoglobin. It gives up or unloads more oxygen. So that's C, okay? All right, moving on. Eight, how is tissue fluid formed? Well, tissue fluid is always is formed due to hydrostatic pressure. Okay, so we have hydrostatic pressure forces out at the beginning and then we have oncotic pressure that kind of pulls most of it back in at the end of the capillary. Nine, carbon dioxide is carried in the blood from tissues to the lungs. And what form is most, it should say, what form is most of this carbon dioxide? Most of it, is as hydrogen carbonate ions in the plasma D. So those are HCO3 minus. Um, in the chloride shift uh, in blood in the tissues, where do Cl ions diffuse? Well, they counteract, um, they counteract the outward diffusion of HCO3 um, from the red blood cells. Okay, so a red, so here's draw, Draw a red blood cell. I'm on it. Okay. I found this on the web for HCO3 from the red blood cell. Siri thinks I'm talking to her. I'm not talking to you, Siri. Go away. Um, so this is an RBC. Now this diffuses out of the red blood cell. And to balance that, we have chlorine diffusing in, Cl minus. So it's into erythrocytes to maintain, hang on a minute, is that right? Uh, no, it's into that's the one. Into erythrocytes to maintain electrical neutrality. pH is only to do with H plus, so it's not that one. So it's A. I would add this diagram into your mind map. Let's do that very very quickly because uh, I've got it here. Um, so here we have here, and I think that's. This one, actually, it's just this label there. Cl minus in uh, maintains electro electrical charge, let's say. Okay, and now back to the multiple choice questions. Okay. 11. Where does the tricuspid valve prevent backflow of blood? Well, this one, I actually didn't think you needed to know this for your syllabus. Well, I guess you do. Um, you Normally, you can talk about these valves such as atrioventricular valves, but actually there's two different types of atrioventricular valve. Weirdly, on one side of the heart, there's two valves that kind of lock together, and on the other, there's three separate kind of valves that lock together like kind of like that. Um, so the tricuspid is on the right, this one, from the right atrium to the rent, right ventricle. Hang on, no, this one, from the right ventricle to the right atrium. So it prevents backflow from the ventricle to the atrium. We want blood to flow from the atrium into the ventricle. This one prevents backflow there. Let's just add that to the mind map again, because I think it's important. So here, this AV valve on the left-hand side equals the bicuspid. 
and this atrioventricular valve on the right hand side is the tricuspid. Um, don't really know how you how you need to remember how you can remember that. I always found it a bit weird because uh, you know the left hand side is the stronger side of the heart, so I kind of felt like I thought it was just a bit odd that the bicuspid was kind of stronger than the tricuspid. Maybe you think that three things locking together would be stronger, but that's why I remembered it. I just remember it. Um, that sort of little oddness that didn't seem to work right in my head, but now I remember it. Okay, uh, which one of the following options? Um, occur during ventricular systole in the mammalian heart. Uh, does volume increase? No, because we're pushing blood out of the ventricle. Does the bicuspid valve open? No, it's going to be firmly shut because otherwise the blood would go out to the atria. Does ventricular pressure increase? Yes, it does. Let's see. Aortic pressure, no, that doesn't decrease either. 13, bit of maths here. Okay, in an adult human, first of all, let's pick out the important information. There are five litres of blood and it circulate about once a minute. Okay, so if we are in the pulmonary vein, uh, the 100 centimetres of blood can carry about 50 cm of CO2. And then if we're uh, in the pulmonary artery, it can carry 55 centimeters of CO2. So what does that mean? Okay, so that means that when blood is heading towards the lungs in the artery, it's carrying 55 CO cm of CO2, but when it comes back from the lungs in the pulmonary vein, it's carrying 50. So there's a change of five, okay? So five cm cubed lost of, of uh, CO2 per 100 millimetres, okay, that's important, per 100 millimetres. What is the approximate volume of CO2 excreted per minute from the body? Well, five litres of blood per minute flow. How many unit? how many 100 millilitre batches are in five litres? Well, that's 5,000 millilitres divided by 100 which would equal 50, okay? So there's 50 batches of 100 millilitres that flow um, through the lungs every minute. So in each batch, each batch of 100 millilitres loses five centimetres cube of CO2. So therefore 50 times five is the volume of CO2 lost, which is 250, which is this one, okay? All right, moving on. Uh, 14 and 15. Ooh, lub dub, or lub dub. Um, the lub uh, is responsible for the first closing uh, of the valve. So both, both of the sounds are caused by closing of valves. They're not opening of valves. When they kind of shut like that, it's, kind of, it's actually that. So if that's the valve that closes to prevent backflow, uh, it makes a noise every time it closes. So definitely not opening, definitely not opening. Which one is it? Uh, closing of the bicuspid or is it the semilunar? The first lub is this one, closing of the bicuspid valve. So that's A. And the second one, the dub sound, is the closing of the semilunar valves. That's C. Uh, I think I should put that on the mind map because I don't think it's there. So this one here is the lub. And this one here is the dub. I, I think it's more lub dub, not lub, lub dub, but anyway. Um, okay. Where are the Perkine or Perkinji fibers in the heart located? Well, I, I guess it's the best one here is probably the septum. Now, if we look at this diagram here, they actually kind of, they're in a bunch of places, but I guess there's a lot of fibers concentrated here, but then they kind of branch out and radiate around. But probably the best one is to say the septum is where um, they are concentrated. And they're concentrated in this thing that we call the bundle of hiss, which is a bunch of these fibers running parallel. Um, so that is the best answer. And that's the answer that they wanted. 
Okay, here we have that pressure graph that we've got of C. So where is the semilunar valve in the aorta open? When does it open? So it's going to open at B. Okay, because this is when the pressure, if you look at this graph, let's just pop some colors on this. So this is the atrial pressure that I'm sort of doing in yellow. And let's do ventricle pressure in blue underneath, and then it crosses over. Ooh, can I follow this? Yes, I can. Like so. And it goes underneath. And then we've got the aortal pressure here. Like so. So whenever something crosses over, we've got a valve opening or closing. So B is where the semilunar valve opens. Uh, 18 semilunar valve in the aorta close, that's D. Uh, bicuspid or mitral valve close, that is when the pressure in the ventricle gets above that in the aorta, so that is A. Yeah. All right, last question. Oh, tough one, actually. Okay, the graph below shows oxygen dissociation curves for hemoglobin in pigeon blood. Okay. Right, now this is one of those classic questions that students are going to like panic about because they're going to say, we've never learned about pigeon blood. That is true, you have not. But you've learned about these curves for other blood, so you should be able to apply your knowledge. So it says here that pigeon blood, um, it's affected by temperature and pH to release oxygen. So both increased temperature and increased, sorry, um, increased temperature and decreased pH cause the blood to release oxygen, which means that it would have a lower affinity. So basically, um, if we look down here, if we, it's going to have a lower affinity, or actually more this way, actually, let's get rid of that one. So um, H plus ions or high temperatures are going to cause it to release oxygen. So which one is going to be the lowest temperature and the lowest carbon dioxide concentration. I guess that's the tricky bit there. You have to remember that carbon dioxide concentration causes H plus ions to be produced because of um, how carbon dioxide gets turned into carbonic acid, which then breaks down to release H plus ions. So basically, this is uh, high CO2 and high temperature. So the lowest CO2 and the lowest temperature is going to be the top one, which is A. And there we go. All right. OK, so I hope that was helpful. Uh, do make sure to make those extra little modifications to your mind map to capture those bits of uh, information that we forgot to put on. Well, I forgot to put on. Um, and send me a picture of your marked work on Teams. OK, thanks very much for all your lovely work this half term. Uh, that's the end of this half term. Um, I'll be back after half term. We've actually almost finished revising all of year 12. So really, really well done. Uh, after half term, I think we've just got about two more mind maps to do the first week back after half term. And then we're going to start moving on to some uh, practice papers. Uh, and I'll be filming kind of run through videos a bit like this one uh, for those papers. OK, so have a great half term. Do make sure you get a bit of rest. Uh, catch up if you have to complete any work you haven't quite finished yet. But do make sure to get some rest and get outside and enjoy this lovely weather. OK, thanks. Bye bye.